My dear sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to part 5 of this incredible talk about magic, evil eye and envy. And today in this part we are going to speak about Suleiman and the incredible kingdom that Allah gifted this man. And uh, the proof that is uh, the reason why Allah gave Suleiman this kingdom is just to act as a proof that magic, evil eye and envy do not exist. Because in this incredible story about Suleiman, all elements in that story speak about the failing of existence of magic. And they will be in that story, just like it was in Musa's story with the magicians of the Pharaoh. The part of the story which concerns us here about Suleiman's kingdom is the one in particular where Allah gave him power and authority over the jinn. This, the jinn fascinates people. The majority, I'm not, if I'm not scared, I would say in every hundred Muslims, you will find 99 of them who are absolutely scared of the jinn and the hundreds of them is almost 50% scared of the jinn. Hardly ever you will find somebody who is completely at ease with the jinn and their world. And that's because it comes from a point of ignorance from what is inside the Quran. Suleiman's story will help us understand the implications of what he asked of the kingdom he begged of Allah. Because when Allah gave him that kingdom, he promised not to give it to any other human after him, not even to the angels, nobody. Alrighty? So what Suleiman asked and what Allah gave him, him shall educate us greatly about what is possible and what is not possible when dealing with this dark topic of magic, evil eye and envy. So let's get started with Suleiman. But before I get started and talk about his kingdom, let me bring in two elements to you. The first one is that Suleiman was born with a golden spoon in his mouth. He was born as the son of a courageous and an already famous king, Dawood. After all, his father, Dawood, was in the army of Talud, and then he killed the tyrant king, Jalud. And then after him, the children of Israel entered the Holy Land and they started their lives. You see, the, king, the, the children of Israel in the desert have had enough of their exodus. So one day they went to a prophet who was amongst them and they said, Would you please ask of Allah to make dua for us and everything, that he sends us a king, and that king we shall fight with him because we have been driven out of our lanes and we have, our kids have suffered, our wives have suffered. We need to go back home and to the blessed land, what today we call Palestine. So their, king, their prophet made dua to Allah and Allah sent them a king king whose name is Talud. Talud was a strong and powerful king. In the army of Talud was a young man called Dawood, David. And it was David, Dawood, who killed Jalut, the other tyrant king. And that's how the story. So Dawood was already famous. When Talud died, Dawood inherited the kingdom of Talud and Allah had given Dawood already a few things the mountains, the birds, and he, he gave him a few other things. When then Suleiman was born to his father with a golden spoon in his mouth because he born in a king to a kingdom and uh, everything. After that, when Suleiman inherited from his father, he inherited a kingdom as well. And that kingdom, not only that, already the kingdom of his father is fascinating. It totally fascinated. Again, I'm not going to go in details about this now because it's going to take us hours. But inshallah, I'll cover this when I speak about the life of the Prophet. And I'll go in details and I'll make it, and I'll make it inshallah in a, in a story like so that you enjoy it and you learn a lot of good things. But for now, we know that Suleiman has inherited the kingdom of his already incredible kingdom of his father. And then Suleiman made another dua to Allah. He asked of Allah to grant him and gift him a kingdom that Allah shall never ever 
grant to anyone else. In other words, whatever Allah gave Suleiman, no other human after Suleiman will see that. Suleiman understood the language of the ants. Direct, no translator. He listens to them and he understands them. This gift will never ever be given to any other human after Suleiman. Just like that of the jinn. No other human will have control or interaction with the jinn after Suleiman. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when I say Suleiman, when I say Dawood, these are not the real names of these people. Suleiman's real name is not Suleiman. Dawood's real name is not Dawood because these two men were Jewish people. And Jewish people have different names than our names. For example, in the realm of the Jews, they call him Solomon or Solomon or something like that. But when Allah spoke to us in the Quran, in Arabic, or at least he spoke to the Arabs, he translated the highest attribute of that person and uh, uh, give them the, uh, that name. For example, Suleiman is a endearment term for Suleim, Salim. Salim means someone who is sane, who is not hurt, who is not harmed. So the name Suleiman is just a translation of the Hebrew name. So if you want to know the real name of Suleiman, we go to the, to the Bible, the Torah in Hebrew, and we hear what they called him. So that's what it is. So as I said about the kingdom of Suleiman, as we all know, Suleiman had inherited from his father an already powerful kingdom. It had a few other things. And then Suleiman made another dua to Allah. Allah has narrated this in Quran, وَبَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood, And Suleiman inherited his father Dawood. And then Suleiman said to the people, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ عُلِّمْنَ مَنْتِقَ الطَّيْرِ O people, we have been taught the communication of the birds. And mantiq also in Arabic is the logic, the thinking process. So Suleiman not only did understand the birds, but he understood how birds thought and uh, acted. So he knows how the eagles think and how they act. He knows how the crows think and how they act. And he, and he can communicate with them. In other words, Suleiman was fluent in all bird languages. And we know all birds have different languages. So that's one thing that is extremely... Today we have done the studies and we can understand and we see birds, they talk. And so, so we've, but we cannot communicate as fluent as Suleiman did. So that's the one thing. And then he says, وَأُوتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ شيء. And we have been, him and his dad, been given of everything that existed at that time. Allah didn't give them helicopters and submarines and uh, computers, tablets, iPhones and things like that. Because at that time they did not exist. But what existed at that time, Allah gave them of that everything. So Suleiman and his father had everything in their kingdom that everybody had. And then Suleiman establishes this truth and he goes, Inna hadha lahu al al -mubin. This certainly is the most evident privilege that Allah has granted a human being. And from the mouth of Suleiman, we learn that him and his father have been already granted everything that people can have in their time. Was Suleiman satisfied with that? Of course not. He was not. So what he did, he went another extra mile and he asked Allah of something and that something will put Suleiman and his kingdom in a complete different league of events and status. What Suleiman asked of Allah and what Allah granted Suleiman is extremely important and we must pay great attention to what Allah tells us about what he granted Suleiman. And that is for one fact, because what Allah granted and gifted Suleiman, no human after Suleiman can ever dream to have. In other words, Suleiman conversed, for example, with the Hudhud, with the bird, he conversed with him like I speak to you and you speak to me, in direct thing. No other human will ever come one day and have a conversation with the bird. It's impossible. Suleiman said, Rabbi, ighfir li, my Lord, forgive me. 
وهب لي ملكا and gift me a kingdom he didn't say grant me he didn't say give me he said gift me because what Allah is going to give Suleiman is truly a gift what is Allah going to give Suleiman that is a gift no other human will have keep this in mind it's important and then he said gift me a kingdom that cannot be gifted to anyone else after me you indeed are the gifter and the good news for Suleiman Allah had accepted his dua and here is what on top of what he already has from his father it's incredible what he had from his father but Allah gave him more Allah didn't give him more money or more properties or more castles he gave him something that no other human can ever have for example take for example Jeff Bezos the owner of Amazon today when you look on the internet as of December 2022 his worth is 124 billion dollars point one by a point hundred million so the guy is extremely rich right but was he richer than Suleiman sure he was compared to our time to his time but what Allah gave Suleiman Jeff Bezos can spend all that money and he never get one thing of what Allah gifted Suleiman Jeff Bezos can spend all his wealth to be able to travel in a morning trip from 6 a.m. to 12 noon that is six hours a journey of a whole month meaning he gets on a plane and in six hours time he can travel the journey that other people would usually take a month to cross and that is impossible not 124 billion and not 600 billion and not billions of billions can do that but that is what Allah gave Suleiman فسخرنا له الريح تجري بأمره رخاء حيث أصاب and we gave power to Suleiman over the wind which at his request runs gently wherever he willed in another ayah Allah says and to Suleiman we gave him the power over the wind its morning journey the distance of a month and its afternoon journey the distance of a month someone might say for example in a plane today if you take the plane which just runs like 500 miles an hour if you stick your head out of a plane's window your head gets cut off why because the power of the wind you've done this experiment before when you are in a car and the car is going just 60 70 miles and you stick your hand out have you seen the resistance of your hand against the wind because the harder it is for you to keep your hand out now imagine that for Suleiman a wind so fast that can transfer him a journey of a whole month 30 days it crosses it in few hours that really is a gift from Allah and that's why Allah said it runs gently and Suleiman controls it like you would control the AC in your home or the fan or you control the heater in your home if it's too hard or it's too fast or too powerful you just turn it down a bit imagine that someone possessed total control over the wind and it controlled it as he liked it as if the power of the wind was a switch in the hands of Suleiman that is Allah what, what Allah blessed Suleiman with it's incredible then he added on top of this already impossible thing no other human shall ever have we humans we will never ever be able to travel the distance of 30 days in few hours we will never do that no matter how fast we go we can never control the wind we can work with the wind but we cannot control the wind or make it run as smooth and gentle as we like it or as fast things like that it's not gifted to us and then on top of this incredible miracle Allah did something else he added a shayateen the shayateen are the evil of the jinn the disbelievers of the jinn the horrible the, 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 the harmful ones harmful to their people not to us 
So Allah gave to Suleiman, a human being, power over the evil jinn, the shaitans. And he turned Suleiman, because this shaitan, they could fly, they can go deep in the oceans. And Allah says in the Quran, Kulla banna'in wa khawas. These devils, they had the ability to build, and they were also divers. You see, this, this, this is incredible. The jinn, the horrible, the shayateen of them, the devil of them, were at the service of Suleiman. Imagine that! Suleiman having total control over the jinn, the good of them to serve in his armies and the bad of them, that he uses them as construction people, as divers, they go inside and they are hard, they, do powerful things like carrying heavy duties and things like that. No other human in the history of mankind before or after Suleiman was given this extremely powerful tool. Control the jinn, the naughty and the rebellious of them. And then Allah goes on and adds to what he did. And as for those horrible devils that did not yield and obey Suleiman, they were bounded together in chains. Punishment. Yes, just like we pick up criminals and we handcuff them. And you, uh, if you see them today in the court in the United States, they will put a chain in the middle of their torso by the waist and then they get the handcuffs and they tie them there and the legs and they tie them there and the person comes all chained. It's horrible sight. But for Suleiman, all these horrible jinns, the disobedient ones, that was their fate. Whoever doesn't listen to the Suleiman gets chained and punished. Yes, a human being punishing the jinn. And only that, with all this wind that trans, Allah gave him other things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made for Suleiman the copper the copper, which is the material, the copper, like the iron and wood, things, the copper. Not only did Allah make it melt for Suleiman, but Suleiman had rivers of it. Let me put this in perspective so that you get the gift of Allah on Suleiman. Any material out there has got two elements. They have the melting point and the boiling point. For example, water, if we need to boil it, it's 100 degrees Celsius. You need to do it, you need to boil it to 100 degrees Celsius and it will evaporate. That's it, it becomes a vapor. But if we want to melt it, it's far less than that. And that's why if we have snow and we want to melt it, we, d we don't need 100 degrees Celsius. We need far less than that. So, what Allah is talking about is He made the copper boil for Suleiman and then kept it melted for his usage. To melt copper, you need 2562 degrees Celsius for water. To, uh, sorry, to boil the copper and keep it melted, of course, you need 2562 degrees Celsius for water. Just if you want to boil water, we need 100 degrees Celsius. 2,562. At that time, it was impossible. Today, in our factories, we cannot have rivers for uh, copper to run free as if it was water. And that's why Allah said, وَأَسَلْنَا لَهُ عَيْنَ الْقِطَرِ And we made the spring of molten copper flow for Suleiman. Ya Allah! Power over the wind, power over the jinn, power over the material of constructions. And then came another portion of the jinn. You see the shayateen, they used to dive for him and construct the disobedience uh, in chains. But the regular jinn, the good jinn, they used to work for him as he liked. وَمِنَ الْجِنِّ مَنْ يَعْمَلُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ And from the jinn, there were those who worked at the command of Suleiman by the authorization of his Lord. Because if Allah does not authorize that, no, uh, no humans will work with the jinn. So when a magician tell you, oh, they call on the dark forces of the jinn, we tell them, curse you. Because you're saying that Allah has authorized the jinn to work with you? 
And if they say yes, we tell him you are a liar because the last one that have been authorized is Suleiman. After Suleiman, Allah authorized no human to work with the jinn or to summon the jinn. And that is why the magician is a disbeliever. Even if they pray the five daily prayers and they fast and everything, and because of the, uh, just around the corner, they say they, are, they can do things that Allah said no other human can do. Or it won't be granted to somebody else. And that is where the danger of what people say to uh, live today in. When you are scared of the magic, you actually, in one of the two, it's either somebody is a disbeliever, a kafir, or is a mushrik. But you cannot be just, uh, oh, I didn't mean that. No. If you are a good Muslim and you believe, but you're still scared of magic, you are a mushrik. You have associated with Allah. That's a dangerous thing. As for those who practice the magic of dealing with the... I'm, I'm not talking about the card magic, the Hollywood magic, the Las Vegas magic. I'm not talking about the entertainment magic. I'm talking about the magic of the charlatans, of the, the sorcerers, of the sorcerers, like the Gandalf of the Lord of the Rings or uh, Harry Potter, that kind of... Uh, uh, I go through a wall and that kind of stuff. That doesn't happen. And that's why well, Allah says, وَمِنَ الْجِنْ And from the jinn, من يعمل بين يديه بإذن ربي those who worked at his command by the authorization of his Lord and then Allah says this ومن يزغ منهم ومن يزغ منهم عن أمرنا and whoever of them deviated from our command listen here even though Allah has given power to Suleiman over the jinn but at the end of the day when the jinn obeyed Suleiman they obeyed Allah in the primary thing just like the angels when they yielded to Adam they didn't yield to Adam they obeyed to Allah and that's why Allah says whoever of them of the jinn deviated from our command Allah's command to obey Suleiman is then Allah would min sair, we would let him taste of the torment of the hell in other words for the jinn and that is, I'm not talking about the evil jinn here I'm talking about the believing jinns, the good jinns at that time. Those who were at the service of Suleiman, because not all the jinn were at the service of Suleiman. Some of them, Allah gave Suleiman the authority over some of them. Those who were at, uh, working for Suleiman, any of them who disobeyed Suleiman, Allah would punish them because they have disobeyed Allah. Because Allah orders them to obey Suleiman. And then Allah would tell us what this jinn have done to Sula for Suleiman, and this is incredible what they did. They built for him and they did for him whatever he pleased. Whatever. Anything that comes to Suleiman in his mind, those jinn would do it for Suleiman. And for example, he did order them to build for him maharib wa tamathil. They would build spacious rooms. You see, if you see these big, gigantic, huge rooms, and uh, there is a movie, uh, I think, in, uh, on um, Prime, Prime, Amazon Prime, it's called uh, John Carter, uh, John, G-O-H-N, Carter is C-A-R-T-E-R. -E it's one of these sci-fi movies. And uh, when you walk into that, uh, of these gigantic, beautiful, kingly rooms, it takes your brain away because of how they did it in Hollywood. But Suleiman, he had that kind of rooms, the, the room of castles, gigantic ones, built to him by the jinn. And not only that, in those big castles, they would build to him, for him, what tamathil and statues. Suleiman was man who loved art. And they would do all kinds of statues to them. And this is one of the arguments that uh, some scholars use about uh, pictures and statues in your own home are halal because um, Suleiman is a prophet and the jinn would build for him statues by his order. So if it's haram, Allah wouldn't allow that. Um, but anyhow, so that's a topic for another day. And then Allah says again, and they would build for him Jifan in Kal Jawab, and they would build for Suleiman huge reservoirs, basins, like huge reservoirs to store water, to store copper, to store whatever he wanted. And also on top of all this, they used to build some um, like big, huge ovens, like cooking pots. 
and they, these pots were fixed in the grounds and that's when they used to mix metals and the metal was to build the weapons for the armies and also when Suleiman wanted to travel with his armies they needed something some kind of strong platform where they would stand in and sit in and all that kind of stuff like the planes today so that when the wind carries them the army won't fall from all kinds of uh, so they had this um, let's say they built like a big box and then the armies are inside they sit in there they have a restaurant where they eat and all this at the time of Suleiman. Of course, Suleiman is not going to make a box, but you see what I mean. It's just like the planes today, but it's just different. In another ayah, Allah showed us the power He granted to the jinn of Suleiman, both in what they can carry and how fast they can move. This is clearly mentioned in the Quran in the story of the Queen of Saba the Queen of Sheba, as is translated in the Bible. When Suleiman wanted to show this powerful queen, who at her time was like the United States in our time, developed superpower, it had a huge kingdom. So when Suleiman heard that this queen and her people worshipped the sun and they prostrated to the sun, as the bird told him and things like that, Suleiman wanted to give dawah to these people and also show them that they were not the most powerful on earth and that when Allah gives uh, another person a kingdom and what he gives them what he wants i.e. what Allah wants you can uh, you can have the strongest and most powerful kingdom so Suleiman set on a journey to show that to the queen and he sent for her the bird and you know the the communication the bird through uh, like a, a letter she reads the letter is from Suleiman and Suleiman tells them come to me and do not come to me in state of war come to me peacefully let's talk let's get to know each other and then what the queen did she arranged for a, s a small uh, gift for Suleiman and what she's told her people she goes okay let's send them this gift full of gold and emeralds and uh, nice uh, precious stones and see what he does if he accepts them we know that this king is after our kingdom but if he doesn't accept them then we see well, how we deal with them so when this gift or treasure was taken to Suleiman Suleiman got upset and they said is it what you give me you think like you buying me I will prepare an army that comes to you you will not see the end of it because the beginning of it will be with you and the end hasn't left or hasn't uh, moved away or left my town this very expression later on got translated by the Arabs and they will tell you the Khalifa the commander of the believer uh, wrote a letter to the Emperor of Rome and he told him if you do not set this woman free I will come to you with an army the first man in your city and the last man in my town just like to say how big the army but this one was actually coined and used by Suleiman in the Quran copied by the other one and copied with a big lie so Suleiman here wanted, as the queen was coming to visit him, Suleiman wanted to show her how powerful he is, how powerful Allah has made him. So one day he holds a meeting with his, uh, whoever are close to him. Of those people he held a meeting with were the jinn. So Suleiman held a meeting with the jinn because he knows that human beings cannot do what he wants. He could have sent the wind, but Suleiman wanted something faster than the wind. So he goes, Ya ayyuhal mala, oh you my chiefs, the chiefs that are around me, who of you can bring me her throne before they come to me in a state of peace, peacefully? It's not a matter of going there, picking the, the seat and come here. What Suleiman ordered is this. Any one of you who can go to where the throne of this lady is in the big rooms and brings the, the, the throne and the, the room in which it exists, bring both of them. And, and of course, that is a huge feast. Who's going to do that? And, and so, one mighty and powerful Ifritun min al jinn, mighty and powerful jinn one of those not uh, he's not a friendly user this jinn but he is powerful and extremely mighty said to Suleiman I 
I can get it to you. Now, bear in mind, Suleiman was in the Holy Land. Israel, Palestine, whatever, but it's the Holy Land. The Queen of Sheba either was farthest of Al Yemen or somewhere in Ethiopia, as the different narration. But we're going to say she's thousands of miles away. This jinn tells Suleiman that I can get to you the throne and where it exists before you leave, before you stand up from this meeting and you leave. So if Suleiman was going to be in 30 minutes and leaving from there, the throne and wherever room it exists shall be there in front of it. Suleiman was not convinced. That I want it a little bit quicker than that. But before Suleiman moved to another suggestion, that powerful jinni said to Suleiman, "Wa inni alayhi laqawiyun amin." And on this task of bringing the throne and whatever it ha it is with all the decorations and everything, he goes, "I am quite strong and very reliable. You can trust me for doing the job and do it as you like it to how you like it." Suleiman, as I said, wanted something quicker. Then another jinn, who also was a believing jinn, who had the knowledge of the scripture. The scripture here is the Torah and whatever was revealed to Dawood. He said to Suleiman, and this is like, humans will never get there. He goes, Ana, I, me, atika bi, I get you the throne of this queen with everything that is attached to the throne wherever it is before you blink your eye now imagine this this jinni as he spoke this sentence and the time for Suleiman to hear it and understand it Suleiman had blinked his eye as soon as he opened his eye he saw it standing right in front of him. And when he saw it fully placed before him in a blink of an eye, it's incredible, incredible to bring a throne with all the decorations and everything thousands of miles away as it is in a split of a time. And that was not magic. That was a speed of execution. That was not magic. Today we would have called that magic. But that was not magic. And that's why when Suleiman saw the throne right in front of his very eyes, what did he say? He didn't say, wow, look at you. Good job. Oh my God, I didn't know you could do that. No. He straight away said, هذا من فضل ربي. He said, this is from my Lord. And this is a bounty from my Lord. You can read about this story in Surah An-Naml 27 from Ayah 38 to 40 and in other parts of the Quran. This statement of Suleiman, Hadha min fadli rabbi, this is from my Lord's bounty. We will see it later on when we talk about the two angels of Babylon, Harut and Marut. The two angels, they say, of course, that they came down to teach people magic. When Allah said that Suleiman has not disbelieved, but the shayateen disbelieved, what Allah is saying is Suleiman never ever took full responsibility and praise for himself because it's him who did it. He always attributed whatever he got to Allah. Anyhow, we will get back to this point later on when we speak about the Harut and Marut and all that kind of stuff. To summarize what Allah gifted Suleiman from and the devils and the shayateen and all the surfaces and everything, we come up with the following. The jinn, both the good of them and the evil of them, were under the control of Suleiman. The jinn, part number two, the jinn, both the good of them and the evil ones, were totally submitted to Suleiman and they could not tell him no. They only obey him. All this power that Allah gave to Suleiman will never ever be given to somebody else after Suleiman. So when a magician tells you, oh, I can summon the dark forces to put a spell on somebody else, what they are saying, what they are saying is this, I can tell the jinn what to do and they will do as I tell them to do. 
And that is a lie because Allah hasn't given this power to anyone else except Suleiman and Suleiman is dead. So again, if someone says that they work with the jinn to pass their magic or sorcery or witchcraft or anything, be that magic or the evil eye or the envy and apply it on someone else, what they are saying is that Allah has given them what he promised to never give to anyone beyond Suleiman. And this is a golden rule that we have to keep in mind. Suleiman made a special request, gift me a kingdom which cannot be gifted to anyone else after me. And Allah answered and gifted him that gift. He gave him that kingdom and part of that was total control over the jinn, the good and the evil of them. And no other human can have that pleasure of controlling the jinn. All right. Now, before Suleiman, people used to receive information from the jinn on some type of informations. This, what I mean by that, before the coming of uh, Suleiman and until up to the Quran, the jinn used to go and fly to the heavens, the lowest part of the heaven, and they would spy on the angels and what they say. You see, when Allah orders something to take place, there is a chain of command that is always ahead of the angel and then he gives uh, like a manager of the group of the angels for example i'm just gonna uh, i'm gonna just give an example yeah it's not true but it's just to bring the idea to normalcy let's say that the, the rain and the weather it has a team of the angels that work with and we're gonna kill, call the team that the team weather this so all angels that work in the weather belong to that team when allah wants to do something with the weather he will order the chief of that weather team and he will tell him for example yeah tomorrow i want rain and i want uh, 500 milliliter here 200 milliliter there this is how Allah manages the world. And 600 milliliters there, in that desert, no rain in there. So Allah gives instruction to that chief angel. Then the chief angel goes and distributes the tasks to the other angels to carry the job. And because the angels, like robots, do not make mistakes, they don't, they don't say, oh my God, I messed up here. I didn't do my job properly. Angels don't do that. They follow the instructions to the letter. And then whatever Allah commands, it happens. Part of what the angels do, for example, now we're going to go to another team of the angels. Those angels, they, they take care of the human statistics. Who gets born and who dies. The same thing. Allah knows that, for example, today 500 babies are due. So Allah gives a command to a team B who deals with the babies, with the birth. Now, as angels talk amongst themselves, yeah, the, the, the manager says to them, oh, you, five angels go to Los Angeles, California, F 15 go to New York City, 10 you go to Mecca, 15 to Al Medina, and he gives order. When they get to the heavenly skies, the ones here that are close to our world, the angels still transmit the information. Back in time, from before Suleiman all the way to, to the time of the Quran. The jinn would go all the way up and they will stay below the heaven and spy. And they would spy. Okay, oh my God, that person there is going to have a boy. Remember back in time they didn't have these uh, scanners where they can tell the, the sex of the babies. So the jinn would hear, oh, for example, uh, Aisha is going to have a boy. So what the jinn used to do, they would go and as they work with the magicians of that time, the charlatans of that time, that's when they mix the information. They go to the uh, magician, the charlatan, and they go, oh, you know what? X, Y, Z is going to have a baby and she's going to have a boy. And then, of course, people go to the magicians and you tell them you're going to have a boy. And as soon as they have a boy, they go, oh my God, he's poor. He knows. He works with the jinn. They can tell. And that's how the charlatans became famous. This practice... This practice stayed in the humans way until the descent of the Quran.
When the Quran came down, Allah Ta'ala shut down this practice and now any jinn that goes to the heaven to spy will be killed. And this is how now, now no more, and this is clearly mentioned in the Quran. But the problem with us, as I said before, is nobody, nobody ever listens to what Allah says in the Quran. In Surah Al-Jinn, which is number 72, and in this surah was revealed in Mecca. All right, it's ranked the 40th surah that was revealed. That means 39 surahs were revealed before it, and the rest of the Quran after it. Something that this surah uh, mentioned, and in particular, that the jinn do not know the unseen, and that whatever they do mention about the unseen used to be stolen from the, uh, the good angels. Uh, the, the angels as when they talk to each other. So in a more direct way, what Allah is telling the people of Mecca is this. Be like the good jinn and not like the evil ones. Because what is going to happen to you is exactly what is going to happen to the disbelieving jinns. And in the surahs of the jinn, there is a surah of the jinn itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides them into groups and he talks about what they can and what they cannot do. And from that moment then, and on that day, until today, until eternity comes, the jinn will never ever be able to spy on what the angels say in the heavens and they will never ever be able to relay to humans whatever it is that the angels are saying up there. This is extremely important. Reason being, in uh, somewhere uh, in history, humans have done a lot of evil to each other. You have charlatans that pretend to know the past present and future and they did that before with the work of the jinn that is how it happens someone goes to the jinn and back then in time the jinn of course they would spy from the angels and they will tell you oh when you were a kid you had this and you go my god how do they know that well nowadays we know the quran has blown their cover and we know that the jinn used to steal from the angel this is extremely important and Allah, when the Qur'an came down, He put an end to this. I truly struggle with the Muslims who believe in the jinn and they say the jinn can do this and can do that. And in the Qur'an it clearly says they cannot. They cannot. And that's why what is today spread around the world as being Islam is not really the Islam of Allah but only translations of what the people of before have said and the majority the major party a huge party of what has been said before is dead wrong and the Quran contradicts it that's why the Quran has become so remote so strange you hardly Ever hear somebody gives you a full talk just by using Allah said, Allah said, Allah. It always goes back, the Prophet of Allah said that and this scholar say. Al-Islam today, when you follow the Quran, you have a new version of Al-Islam. And it truly is. And that is because what Allah says in the Quran has always been ignored. It's the hadith narratives, it's the scholarly opinions, it's the school of thoughts, it's the sunnah, it's this. But it never is Allah and Allah alone, despite the fact that Allah loudly, clearly, directly or directly made the declaration that the Qur'an was completed, terminated, finished. He's pleased with it. The jinn cannot work with the humans. The humans cannot interact with the jinn. But in the Muslim world, still on. Just last night, just last night, uh, sometimes I watch, as I, say, as I said, when I'm researching a topic, I research the topic and I refresh my memory with what I studied before and what I heard before and everything. So there is this sheikh and he said like this, answer to those who deny that the messenger of Allah was ensorcelled. Well, this sheikh, <coughs> Sheikh, he calls him Sheikh. I've written to him a few times, but he doesn't answer, so I, I don't listen to him anymore. But I don't listen to him to gain knowledge from, because anything he says, I know. 
But what it is that yesterday he made like 10 minutes and he responds, he answers people to tell them how wrong they are because the Prophet Muhammad was ensorcelled and he was bewitched for real. And what blows my mind is the question, when you say he was bewitched, what do you mean? Have the jinn, uh, has a jinn put a spell on him? If he says yes, he disbelieves. He disbelieves from so many angles. And if he says no, then the question comes, why do you say insulted? Why? When Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفْرٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ when Allah says in the Quran that say that a group of the, uh, the jinn have listened to the Quran. A band of the jinn were traveling. Uh, how is the story how it goes? Yeah. One day the Prophet Muhammad was uh, performing his salat. We don't know where. Where is not important. But all we know is this. He was reading the Quran loudly. And then what Allah did, some nomad, what some angels who were just traveling the land were going about their business. Because jinn and the humans, we do not mingle. We do not mix. There is no way that a jinn lives with you at home. Impossible. They don't live with us. We don't see them and they do not see us. The only one who can see us is shaitan. The chief, shaitan, the one who disobeyed Allah with Adam and whoever works for him. The rest of the jinn, they cannot see us. In order for the jinn to be able to whisper to us evil, they need to see us. And that is for shaitan and his party. But the rest of the jinn who are believers and they lead their own life and they are not into misguided humans, they cannot see us as much as we cannot see them. So one day a group of the jinn who believed who were Jewish, so to speak, they believed in the Torah. They heard the Torah, they are aware of it, so they were believers in it. They were gone about their business. Muhammad was reading there the Quran loudly. So what did Allah do? He guided the jinn in a manner so that they end up close to Muhammad so that Allah, so that Allah makes them listen to the Quran that is being read. Muhammad was not aware of this and the jinn could not see Muhammad, but they only heard his voice. And Allah documented this event in Surah Al-Ahqaf, that is Surah number 46, from Ayah 29. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Muhammad, قُلْ Say, do tell them, Ya Muhammad, أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ It has been revealed to me. What has been revealed to you, Ya Muhammad? That a band from the jinn had listened. He was not aware at all that the jinn were there and they were listening to him because invisible and they, we cannot see them we cannot feel them we cannot hear them they do not manifest whatever they do even when they talk as they talked when they were near him but he couldn't hear them that a band from the jinn had listened and then when in another surah in Surah Al-Jinn as we shall see they went into details what they heard and everything but here Allah summarizes what they did so they heard and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again in the other surah وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفْرَ مِنَ الْجِنِ and as we directed a group of jinn to you to listen to what you are reading to the Quran so فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ and when they reached it, when they came there, when they came to you, well, as you are listening, they talk to each other and they say, Ansito, listen up. Muhammad didn't hear its complete silence, even though they're talking, but we can't hear them. And they say, hey, listen up. Listen, take notice. And then they listen, and they listen, and they listen. And when the recital of the Quran got terminated, Muhammad finished, this jinn they went back to their clan to whatever clan they were and they went back there as warners and subhanallah they listened yes because when Allah gave us the two accounts of what these jinns the, the clan of it's one clan what they witnessed what they said Allah then documented it when they went back to their people what did they say? And what they say 
is extremely important for our magic, evil eye and envy. Listen up to what they said. قالوا يا قومنا أو our fellows, our people إنا سمعنا كتابا أنزل من بعد موسى We have heard a book, a law that has been descended there after Moses i.e. the Torah why? because these jinns have not met Jesus they are not aware of what Jesus has descended they just heard Musa and they were away so when Jesus came they were not near him but it just happened when Muhammad came they were there so in their history in the chain of events there is Moses up there and then Muhammad up here and that's the reason why they mentioned uh, Musa they say we have heard a law a book revealed after Moses authenticating what is between its hands i.e. the Quran is the validation to Muhammad that he is his messenger alright and that Quran يهدي إلى الحق and this Quran does guide to the truth وإلى طريق المستقيم and to a straight path and then the jinn carry on and they say our people fellows answer the inviter of Allah the Quran and believe in him in Allah and if you do he will forgive you of your sins the jinn commit sins is just a human and will grant you a safeguard from a torment or a painful torment on judgment day and then the jinn carry on saying and whoever doesn't respond to the inviter of Allah and they talk about the Quran because the other jinn have not met Muhammad so here the, the jinn have recited what they have heard and they call that the inviter to Allah because that's what the Quran does and then they say and whoever doesn't respond to the inviter of Allah all right then the punishment of Allah will not be impossible not to reach them they will reach them and then that person there will have none other besides Allah as an ally on judgment today and those people will be the evident straying folks in other words you follow the Quran today the inviter you will believe in Allah you do good Allah will forgive your sins and that is good if you chose not to obey Allah then you gotta know that on judgment day you will have no one to support you and you will straight away go to hell fire so this is one account the other account they said inna sami'na Qur'anan ajaban now Allah tells us the other pieces that uh, at, the, at first when he mentioned the, uh, what they told their people he just omitted these pieces because the, Allah will not narrate the whole story it's like if something uh, happens and you tell people what you think serves the purpose of that story back there and then when you tell the story from another angle you mention the other element of the story this is exactly what happened here they said inna sami'na qur'anan ajaban we have heard something got that, that gets recited so impressively remarkable and that Quran invites to the right thinking yahdi ila rushd and straight there and then when they heard Muhammad reading the Quran they believed in the Quran and they said look here they didn't believe in Muhammad they accepted the Quran because Muhammad is not sent for the jinn Muhammad was sent only for the Arabs for the human beings there is a huge mistake they say oh every prophet was sent to his people except Muhammad our messenger was sent to the people of the entire earth inclusive of the jinn this is a lie I have a talk on YouTube where I speak uh, about uh, the Quran or the Islam was only meant for the Arabs a human being Arabs not for the entire world and you go there it's an hour talk and I have proved all the evidence from the Quran that Allah will not send a human being that doesn't speak the language of others he only sends a human being as a messenger to the people who speak his own language i.e. he is one of them but anyhow so Muhammad is not a messenger to the jinn so when the, when the jinn heard the Quran they obeyed in Allah and that's the reason why they say and we will not associate with our Lord anyone 
وأنه تعالى جد ربنا and he Allah is certainly the most high is truly our Lord he never had any wife nor a child and that's what they heard after that and then it's, it's really incredible really incredible what these people are saying because what these people the jinn have gotten to us Muslims we just say yes of course Allah doesn't have son and that's why we say la ilaha illallah you're wrong that is part of the equation but if you say that the jinn can create and do actions that only Allah can do this is as bad as when you say Allah has got a child and then they carry on the talking and they say وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِهُنَا and our lunatic one the crazy of us the most stupid of us and they talk about the big shaitan they're talking about the, the big shaitan and the lies he tells them what is the they say he extremely said absurd things about Allah that Allah has got a son and Allah he was selling them stuff like that and when they heard the Quran they realized that Allah doesn't have a son and that a shaitan was just lying to them they carry on saying and we never ever considered nor thought that humans and the jinn would ever speak lies about Allah of course we do Jesus is son of Allah that's a lie and a human being can control the jinn and put a spell on somebody else that's a lie and someone out of nothing just speaks some random terminologies blah blah abracadabra and things like that and move his hand in certain manner and then he tell you I put a spell on somebody she will not give birth that's a lie who is he? is he a god so yes humans and the jinn we have fabricated lies against Allah and then they said something extremely important. They said, of course, the only thing they say important, but for our topic, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنْسِ This is a habit that the Arabs used to do before, and they still do it today. What is that? And whenever some man from the humans, who, when they travel, would seek protection from some man from the jinn. The jinn, they have also male and female. What the Arabs used to do when they travel at night in the desert and things like that, when they get to a place where they want to just relax for the night and sleep and for the next day, the Arabs had this habit of seeking refuge from the evil of the jinn that inhabits that valley or that place or that corner of the mountain. Because the Arabs used to believe that the jinn are everywhere. As soon as the jinn hear this, they go, okay these people are scared of us now let us give them some headaches and then the jinn start messing up with people they would for example move a tree and you hear the children go what's that I'll give you an example yeah sometimes at night <laughs> it reminds me of a friend of ours who used to be scared of the jinn to no end he had a long beard and he was a super Salafi back in my Salafi days but he used to if you mention the jinn to him he gets shaky so when we would go camp or sometimes we sleep in a masjid and things like that and uh, everybody is asleep except him and I go XYZ I said why are you not sleep he goes I hear footsteps I hear someone is closing the door so and I go what do you mean so I said look everybody is asleep except you he goes yes he goes no I can hear what can you hear he goes the jinn are closing the door they're doing the window they're moving this you see even though there is nothing going on but he attributes and he links everything that happens there to the jinn and this is what Allah is talking about and that some of the human male the man would seek refuge in some of the uh, male of the jinn so what did the male of the jinn do they added to their agony and this is why Allah has warned us in the Quran that ya bani adam children of adam don't let a shaitan challenge you as he exited your parents from the gardens and the shaitan here did two things that are extremely distinct and they still work until today he beautifies the evil just like he did it for our father and mother 
when he said that the tree that Allah had forbidden them is an eternity tree. You eat from it, you'll never die. And you'll have an, a never-ending kingdom. And he promises and he lies. And he convinces you that it's good, all this through whispers. And then he lets you commit the sin and then only you pay for the sin. I will stop here because you got to the 59 and I will carry on inshallah with part 2 from the kingdom of Suleiman and his interaction with the jinn and the upcoming part that will be part number 6. This is again your brother Abdul Salam and uh, off to part uh, 6. Thank you for listening all the way up to here. Assalamu alaikum.